Thank you so much. I am Chandler Precht, one of the directors of our sustainability graduate programs, and I oversee our capstone workshop course. I'll be your host this evening. Welcome to the summer 2024 capstone workshop final briefings. Our capstone workshop course serves as the culminating educational experience for students in our sustainability management program. Students must draw on their problem solving and technical skills that they've gained throughout this program to address crucial sustainability issues as consultants for their respective clients. Each team will have 10 minutes to present their work, followed by five minutes of Q&A. If you're in the audience, please raise your hand and we'll have somebody bring you a mic. Sabrina Martins will kick us off. This team has been working with the Climate Equity Foundation under the direction of Kizzy Charles Guzman. Sabrina. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sabrina Martins, and I'm presenting on behalf of Small Island Developing States Capstone Project, uh, where we are ex examining the existential climate threats and pathways to solutions. A quick rundown of our agenda. I'll give you a brief overview of our client, uh, present the problem, and why we are spending time discussing this tonight. Uh, discuss our overarching themes and takeaways from our work uh, throughout the semester identify solution pathways, double click into one of our case studies, uh, Fiji, and then give you guys a quick rundown of the path forward for this uh, project in the future. Uh, meet our wonderful team. Uh, we don't have time to get into everybody's backgrounds today, but we would be remiss if we didn't say a big thank you to Kizzy for all of her leadership during the semester. She's been a, an incredible advisor on this, on this journey. Um, our client is Jeanette Pablo. She is the CEO of the Climate Equity Foundation. They're a U.S.-based nonprofit focused on the intersection between climate change and environmental justice. Um, she brought this project to us to help her uh, start to map out some of the existential climate threats facing small island nations, as well as identify potential solution pathways in the future. So there are 57 SIDS, or small island developing states, throughout the world. These are generally small countries that are surrounded by large bodies of water. This capstone project uh, used five as a case study for digging into the challenges and pathways forward for these different countries. Um, the Maldives, Tuvalu, Fiji, and Kiribati were assigned to us from the client, and we chose Guyana on our own. We chose Guyana to diversify, uh, geographically diversify the set of countries that we were exploring, as well as to get a country that has a little bit of um, mainland territory in addition to the islands. Guyana also has recently discovered oil, and we were kind of curious as to what that meant in terms of the potential for um, climate resilience programming in the future. So why do we care about this issue? There are a lot of people who live on SIDS, 70 million people um, that are living in small countries that are chronically underfinanced and under-researched. Um, the IPCC has noted that by 2100, the global mean sea levels in these countries will rise from anywhere from one to four feet. Additionally, the SIDS account for less than 1% of global GHG emissions worldwide, yet bear the brunt of sea level rise and are strapped to figure out solutions and paths forward. Our client asked us to help to develop country profiles for each of our case studies, and we did that through um, researching hundreds of academic papers, reports, articles, um, did all of our uh, ground academic research on economies, um, geography, on politics, on all of the kind of standard things to really deep dive into each of these countries to get a sense of what are the main challenges that they're facing. We also really wanted to center the lived experience of people on the islands, um, and so we conducted primary research via interviews. We conducted 26 interviews with different stakeholders throughout the countries. So these are um, either politicians, business owners, actual community members, uh, members of NGOs or um, different art organizations that operate within the communities to get a sense of what these people are actually facing on a day to day. Uh, we developed these country playbooks and case study fact books to be able to replicate this research in the future. And the clients, uh, we're actually presenting to the client later this week to present our findings. 
The result of all of this was uh, lots of discussion and debate internally within our team, and we were able to come up with a handful of themes. There were seven themes that really came out as the most material um, problems that are facing the small island nations. Sea level rise is a fairly obvious one, but what's not necessarily as obvious is that each of these countries have different starting points. So some of these countries are very low lying. The Maldives is one of the lowest countries in the world, while others have more elevation and therefore have different starting points on how they would at attempt to tackle their climate resilience plans. Food security. Uh, these are small countries that don't have a lot of uh, farmable land, and so the majority, all five of our case studies actually, are food importers, and so food security ends up being a, a challenge for long-term sustainability in these countries. Infrastructure. Urbanization is a, is a theme and a trend that's happening all over the world, including in small island developing nations. The challenge for these countries is that they actually uh, are urbanizing on the coast. And so there's a lot of potential for flooding and a lot of this urban infrastructure um, is very at risk. Economic standing, a lot of these countries are small and not necessarily uh, prosperous. So the entire GDP of Kiribati, for example, is $200 million. To put that into context, the Battery Park City Coastal Resilience Project also has a budget of $200 million to fortify a very small stretch of uh, New York City's coastline. Water resource management, uh, there's always the risk of saltwater erosion on surface uh, water for a lot of these countries, and so ensuring that these people have access to clean, to clean water is an incredibly important piece of sustainability moving forward. Awareness and education, it was our experience that there were different levels of awareness across these SIDS. Some of these countries are incorporating climate, in, in, uh, climate education into their actual you know, elementary school curriculums. Others are less aware of it. So making sure that within the countries there is a, an elevated level of awareness helps to tackle some of these challenges. And then human capital, a lot of these countries suffer from brain drain. And um, for example, the, you know, Tuvalu only has a population of 11,000 people. That means that their entire government is staffed with about 700 people to do the job of an entire government. So when we think about the resources of reporting or engaging in, with multilaterals or getting grants and all the other bells and whistles that come along with some of those solutions, you have to consider that they are very strapped for human capital. So we've identified a number of solution pathways for each of these challenges. We don't have time, unfortunately, tonight to dig into each of these, but we wanted to kind of just at least flash them, and then we'll dig in on, on Fiji um, to give you guys a sense of how these actually materialize. Sea level rise. Um, a lot of, in every single country that we have examined, relocation was discussed um, to differing degrees. Food security, um, raised farm beds, hydroponics, climate resistant crops, all of these were potential solution pathways for food security. Infrastructure, urban planning, policy, climate based design, climate based construction are all things that different SIDS are exploring in terms of ensuring their sustainability in the long term. Economic standing, creative climate finance, COP28 commitments, and government policy are some of the key solution pathways that each of these SIDs are also exploring. Water resource management, water harvesting, and desalination are hot topics across these countries. Awareness and education, knowledge transfers, local education, global awareness, digital media, are all important in terms of um, raising the profiles of some of these challenges. And then human resources, similarly, uh, exchange programs, university partnerships, all of these are, are key components to how some of these countries can attempt to address the human capital challenges. Now to double click into Fiji, um, the friendliest island, which is actually their tourism slogan. The majority of the coast of the population lives along the coast, as you can see here on the left hand side. They're widely reliant on a single source of surface water and 40% of their tourism is linked to 40% of their GDP, I'm sorry, is linked to tourism. So they're heavily um, reliant on external capital. Um, if you think about the frequent hazards that this country uh, experiences, they had 18 violent uh, cyclones since 2018, um, and their sea level rise is twice the pace of the global average. So things are changing very quickly and dramatically in Fiji all the time. In terms of economic shocks, this risks access to clean water, health care, and increases the likelihood of internal strife and the potential for land conflicts. So what can Fiji do about that? 
So in terms of reducing exposure, Fiji is actively looking into relocation. Luckily, Fiji's uh, highest point is 1,300 meter, uh, 1300 meters above the sea level. So they have some elevation in terms of being able to relocate from the low-lying coast to higher elevation. Um, they're also integrating climate-conscious um, uh, urban planning into some of these relocation plans. In terms of water management, um, they are working on rainwater harvesting and water recycling, as well as seawalls and beach nourishments. They're also investing in or exploring investing in renewable energy and are pioneering some innovative new insurance solutions. For example, the UN has a new product that allows policyholders to file claims ahead of natural disasters in order to give them funds to actually fortify their properties or their different or the different um, uh, areas that may be able to reduce the long-term impacts of these cyclones or the, the dramatic uh, weather events. Our capstone team is proud of the work done this semester to understand challenges facing the STIDs, exploring existing and potential solutions, and bringing awareness to a chronically underfunded and under-researched set of countries. This was just one of our case studies. We did five of them, and this was a very brief overview, so I think you guys could get a sense of how many uh, sustainability challenges these countries are really facing. This work will serve as a jumping off point for the Climate Equity Foundation to advocate internationally at the COP meetings, as well as produce a film that highlights the sustainability challenges and equity considerations facing small island developing states. Thank you. Hi, thank you for sharing this information with us. This is fascinating stuff. Um, I was wondering, um, you did mention a lot, you, you mentioned digitalization and its role in, you know, furthering education um, and sharing of information altogether. What does, what are the implications of the tech energy usage on all of this digitization going on? Yeah, I think um, when we talk about digitalization, we came across a couple of examples of really interesting kind of creative novel things that we hadn't really uh, heard about throughout our SUMA experience. So for example, in Tuvalu, um, they're working on, they've actually already digitally mapped the entire island and they were exploring the idea of being the first digital nation. So actually leaving that island, but being able to have ties and continue to have almost like a, a virtual reality experience on the island, despite not actually being able to live there in the long term. So there's all different kinds of ways that technology are being harnessed um, for, uh, for in, in different ways to, to tackle some of these sustainability challenges. We were actually really surprised to see some of them as well. Yeah, of course. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Just curious, what are the governments doing to bring more insurance capital into these islands? I would think that's pretty critical for infrastructure to be built. Yeah, I mentioned, um, I think that the multilaterals are going to play a big kind of brokering role here in the long run. So the UN, for example, with Fiji, that's a, a brand new product that they've never actually offered before. They're working with some private capital, and I think that's in the long run. The intention is to show them, hey, look, this can really work. Um, we're using multilateral public money, which is obviously a bit cheaper. But in the long run, you can have private capital solutions. So I think having these, these pilot programs is going to really enable them to continue to get more dollars in and, and solve some of those insurance challenges that really face all of these island nations. Can I ask a follow-up? Can I ask a follow-up on that? Sure. With the, with the societies somewhat impoverished, how are they going to afford that type of policy? Yeah, so the UN is actually putting it together in a very interesting way. So they're actually allowing, for example, a church to take out that policy, and everybody is paying, and each individual is paying in a little bit, and then the church, for example, is allocating those resources out based on need of their own local population. So there's some actually kind of really interesting creative climate financing solutions that are coming around that I don't think um, we've really seen much of in the past. Thank you. Can I ask? Can you define the concept of relocation? Relocation? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So relocation um, was a big theme throughout most of our work. So there was uh, 
all different versions of it. So the case with Fiji that we talked about earlier, that was internal relocation. So moving from the coast to higher elevation within the country. You also had a country like the Maldives, for example, that was exploring the idea of actually relocating entirely to Australia and actually purchased a piece of land on the coast of Australia and was starting the process of moving uh, their population over. So there's all different ways that it can look. I think the reality is that a lot of these countries despite you know, everyone's best efforts at building resilience and having um, better seawalls and, and em embankments, there's going to be parts of these coasts that are not habitable anymore or infrastructure that isn't really sustainable. So thinking about how, can, how those people can move around is really the, the concept of, um, that we were discussing in, when we say relocation. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>